morning. I heard everybody sing in cantankerous mood this morning. You're in happy mood. Church, good morning. One last time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. If you couldn't tell, today is something of a special day here in the church. It is the 50th day of Easter. That means it is Pentecost, day where we get a little bit more spirit, a little bit more fire, and have a little bit more fun. Because God is not just with us, God is within us. More on that in a little bit. Before we get to our worship today, um, this is weird. Can I, I'm sorry. I'm used to like everyone being over here, and now y'all like are over here. Um, before we get to our worship today, uh, I want to thank all of you over the last few weeks. As many of you know, I uh, and our children's pastor, Zach, and our late delegate to conference, Bill Wright, we're headed up this afternoon. I'm worshiping with you all, and then hopping in my car and headed to northern Kentucky for our annual conference when all the clergy and lay leaders uh, of our church here in Kentucky get together with the bishop, uh, do the business of the church, we worship, uh, and we do try and bless wherever we are. We try and do good uh, and leave people with uh, a high opinion of Methodists. Uh, And so thank you all for helping the last few weeks. I said uh, this is your last day to help in one of two ways. We're taking up a special offering Monday night to go to some special faith communities throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, I encourage you, if you haven't and are able to, any check you write with special offering or annual conference, we'll make sure it gets there. Thank you for all those who've given to that. Uh, And then Combs, big honking Combs. There's still a tray at the Welcome Center. Uh, Tuesday afternoon, many of us at annual conference are going to be assembling health kits to go throughout the country to uh, areas affected by the hurricanes of the last few years and the wildfires of the last few years so that people who've lost everything have something to get them by. And I know a comb doesn't seem like a big deal, uh, but when you've lost everything, uh, just being able to pull it through, just to give some sense of order in your life really does make a difference. And so thank you all who've donated those. I got to pile all those. I hope they fit in my car. Uh, You can still drop those off uh, until I leave today is the deadline for that. Uh, And so now that you've done those things, I have just one more thing to ask of you, which is your prayers. Uh, We are there to work. Uh, We're there to worship and, and to bless the community. We're also there to do the business of the church. And so pray for us. As we vote on petitions, as we elect delegates to general conference next year, uh, as we do all of that and more, just be in prayer for us. It's one of my favorite times of the year. That's, you all are my family, but my fellow clergy uh, are also part of my family, and I enjoy uh, being with them all week. But do be in prayer as we do the work of the church. That's going on all week long, uh, and so you can continue to pray for us. But of course, today uh, is Sunday. Today is Pentecost. Today we are here to worship Uh, in and through the amazing power of God's Holy Spirit. As we prepare to do that, I invite you to quiet your hearts, quiet your minds, open yourselves to the Spirit as we listen to the prelude.
The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit enter our hearts and transform us. You will be surprised at all he leads us to do. Please stand if you are able and join us in hymn number 500, Spirit of the God, Dispend Upon My Heart. going to ask you to pray with me, but first, understand, Pentecost is the day the Holy Spirit descended and all the disciples preached in different languages. Ideally, I would have a number of people to pray in different languages, but I don't know that many around here who do that, and I don't know one. So we're going to do something else. 
going to ask you to pray with me out loud. But understand that the person next to you is not going to say the same prayer you do. In fact, all of us are praying about five different prayers at one time. Be bold. Pray anyway. Pray loudly. Would you join me in our opening prayer? Print it in your bulletin. Come, Holy Spirit, God of wind and flame, blow into our lives. Ignite the fire of hope. Fan the flames of possibility. Transform us into a people who share your love with a world in pain. A people who proclaim your hope into a world given to despair. A people who live as though the world can be changed into the kingdom that is to come. Come, Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. But now, in one accord, if you'll read with me the affirmation of faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated and join us in hymn 420. Breathe on me, breath of God. The tradition at this point in our worship is to spend time in silent prayer, and then later I'll pray for you all, the world, whatever's going on. Today needs to be a little bit different. Uh, I know many of you uh, know Joanne here. Uh, many of you don't, and that's okay. Uh, Joanne, like many of you do, has been offering a prayer request the last few weeks. Uh, in her case, it's for her son-in-law, Tom, uh, who's needed, and then who got a liver transplant, and 
Uh, we celebrated that. It wasn't an easy road, but, but it got there. Uh, we discovered uh, just last night that that liver didn't take. Um, and so uh, Tom and Joanne's daughter Marty are having a really, really terrifying morning. Uh, they don't know if anything can happen after this. They don't know if another one could be available or if it would take. We just, am I right? We don't know. Um, and, and Joanne was talking to her daughter, Marty, and uh, Marty said what I think is great. She said, you just need to get yourself to church right now. I don't care what you're doing. And so Joanne walks in halfway through the service downstairs um, and then finds me after the sermon and, and, and informs me. And so we prayed downstairs for this. But I, as pressing as this is, I thought it was worth taking time uh, to pray for this specifically. And I hope uh, you're okay with that. And so if you would, would you just bow with me as we pray for this family? Heavenly Father, you know all things. You know what's going on. You know the story better than we do. You know the trials that Tom and Marty have been through better than we do. And Joanne, too. God, you know how much faith they have shown already, walking step by step, not knowing what's to come. And God, you know just how devastating this news is. And God, I don't doubt for a second that you've been with this family every single second and that you are with them now. But I want to pray first that especially Marty and Tom, but the whole family in this moment of despair and darkness, that they would have no cause to doubt that your spirit that we celebrate today is still with them. That even in the midst of horror and fear, they would know not just with their minds, but with all of their being, that you were there, weeping when they weep, feeling sadness when they feel sadness, mourning when they mourn, that you are with them and that you will not forsake them. God, send your spirit in a way that they can sense. Send your people, those of us who can't be there, God. We have to count on our brothers and sisters in New York to surround them to give them those physical signs of love, hugs, and food, and prayers. God, we trust them to be your hands and feet in this moment. And so, God, we pray for all that. But of course, God, you've told us to pray for the sick. You've told us, even though we know that not every prayer comes true, that is not a reason to pray for healing. And so we desperately, God, pray for a miracle. We desperately, God, pray that there would be a way forward, that a liver would be found, that it would take, that this would be, that we would look back on this as a setback and not as an end. God, we know that we don't always get what we pray for, but we know that you are our Father, that you love us with a Father's love, with a Mother's love, that you want what is good for us. And so we come, God, begging for healing now. Make this work however you can. God, we pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray all this in your name. Amen. As our ushers come forward to receive the offering, um, if you're a visitor with us, uh, I invite you. There's a space in that bulletin. You can fill out your name and a way to contact you. Uh, you can put that in the offering in lieu of anything else. We just want to thank you for being here and worshiping with us. And whoever you are, I hope there's not a prayer request as urgent as the one we shared today. But if there is someone, even yourself, that you've been praying for, don't break a confidence, uh, but write down what you can. Um, we take those and we pray with them throughout the week. But would you bow with me as we prepare to give our tithes and offerings? Heavenly Father, we know, even in the midst of struggles and challenges, that every good thing we have, every blessing we enjoy, comes from you. And so in, in thanksgiving and appreciation, we now give back to you a portion of what we have received, so that your kingdom would grow, so that your children the world over would have the food and shelter they need, that they would encounter the living presence of your Holy Spirit within them, 
and that they would know that through that Spirit, they belong to your family, and that they would know the love that comes with it. We pray all this in the name of the one who came, who died, but who yet lives even now, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I apologize with Zach uh, coming down ill. We don't have children's church today, but if you'd like to dismiss kids, uh, they can go hang with Miss Linda in the nursery, or they can stay here. We'll give you either option, but we apologize for that. Today's scripture reading is from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one had heard speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that we each hear in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, 
Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of our Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of God for the people of God. That was good. I told Arlene, this is one of the hardest passages to read with all those uh, nation names, but that was good. There's no story like Pentecost. It's one of my absolute favorite stories in all of Scripture. The day the disciples gathered together and the Holy Spirit descended upon them. It's been called the best thing to ever come out of a church meeting. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, we get a lot done in meetings around here. I get impatient if we just sit around talking, so we're actually really productive. Uh, but even so, I can't remember the last time I got together with a group of leaders in this church, and the meeting ended with tongues of fire coming down, all of us preaching in different languages, and bystanders wondering whether we were drunk at nine in the morning. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. Maybe one day. But that's what happened at Pentecost. That's the story of Pentecost. Uh, it's often been called the church's birthday. Which is weird if you think about it. It's an odd day to pick at first glance for the birthday of the church. If I didn't know better, I would have said it would have had something to do with Jesus. You know, when he was born, maybe it was the birthday of the church or his baptism. If nothing else, his resurrection, that should really be the birth of the church, is when Jesus was raised from the dead. But no, none of those. As important as all those things are, Something was still missing in every single case. The church couldn't get started just yet. So what was it that the disciples needed, aside from Jesus, to get the church started? It wasn't anything that we might first uh, think about. It definitely wasn't like a set of articles of incorporation or anything like that. I mean, read the New Testament sometime. Uh, The church was not exactly thoroughly thought out by the disciples when they got going, okay? They mostly made up the whole thing as they went along and succeeded in spite of themselves more often than not. There were no rules or laws that were set down beforehand. They made them up later. They weren't waiting on a new official leader either. You know, Jesus ascended. You could understand them trying to decide who's going to be uh, our official leader moving forward. But no, it took a few years before the disciples elected official church leadership. Leaders are important, but the church doesn't need an official leader in order to change the world. So says your official leader. (laughs) It wasn't even the Bible, actually. No, parts of the Bible wouldn't be written for 50 years yet. And it would be 300 years before the Bible was put together as it now stands. Now, those of us now, we need the Bible because otherwise we wouldn't know what happened. We need it. But the disciples at the time, they'd been there. (laughs) They had seen what had happened. So they didn't even need the Bible to get going. No, to be the church, to be the body of Jesus in the world, to spread the gospel throughout the world, the disciples needed something different from all of that. In fact, they needed just two things. 
They needed the testimony of a risen Jesus, and they needed the presence of the Holy Spirit. They received the testimony the first time they saw Jesus alive again. Again, they were there. They didn't need someone to write it down for them like we do. They'd seen it. And now, finally at Pentecost, they received the Holy Spirit. The birth of the church required a truth to tell and a spirit to help tell it with power. The disciples needed the message of Jesus, which is God with us, and they needed the presence of the Spirit, which is God within us. And once they had both, the message and the presence, the disciples were out of control. I really mean that. They were out of control. Once they had both those things, nothing could stop them. I mean, read the book of Acts sometime. Its full name, if you flip your Bible to the page, it's the Acts of the Apostles. But more than one godly Christian has proposed renaming it to the Acts of the Holy Spirit because it wasn't exactly the disciples who were acting, if you know what I mean. I mean, you know about the disciples. You know what they were like. You think they could have changed the world on their own? I mean, just Peter, for instance. We love Peter because he's hilarious when he's not tragic. With his pride and his thick-headedness, and when it counted, his cowardice, he's a tragic figure. But they all had their issues. Thomas had his cynicism. John had his insecurities. Philip had his need to have everything spelled out for him in advance before he'd sign on to something. They all had their stuff. And yet they and others like them went out from Jerusalem and changed the world. What happened? Well, once they had the message of a risen Jesus... And once they received the presence of the Holy Spirit, their own pride and their own insecurity and their own anxiety, it didn't go away. But (laughs) it didn't hold them back anymore. Who they were, their cultural and religious background, didn't hold them back anymore. And all the powers that be in the world that came against them could not hold them back anymore. Because that is what happens when God's people hear about God with them and embrace God within them. If there has been a goal this entire Easter season, all 50 of these days, it has been for us, you and me, to follow the example of the disciples. I don't know if you've noticed a trend in the many lies I've loved this Easter season, But let me go ahead and spell it out for you. We love these lies because when we believe them, we feel like we're in control of ourselves and the world we live in. But the truth is, we're never as in control as we like to think. That's true. Whether you're Christian, pagan, atheist, it does not matter. If you're a human being, we pretend we are in control. And we love lies that tell us we're in control, but none of us are really in control of our lives. And if we're honest about that, it begs the question, who or what is instead? Is your life at the mercy of whatever's trending right now? I've been there. (laughs) Trying to look like whoever has the largest following on Instagram today passionate about whatever cause is trending on Facebook this month, and then doing the challenge, whatever it is, next month, and then a new one the month after, bouncing from cause to cause. I've been there. Checking your phone even though you're in the middle of a sermon. I see you. Maybe that's not what it is. Maybe instead your life, your actions, maybe they're swayed instead by whatever is being said by your political party or your favorite news outlet Whatever they tell you to be outraged about this week. I've been there too. (laughs) Mad all the time and I don't know why. (laughs) 
so angry about all the world's problems because that's all they ever tell me about are the world's problems. I get cynical. Maybe that's you. I've been there. Or maybe it's a person, a parent, significant other, child, friend. I don't know. They don't need to say much necessarily, but their approval or disapproval pretty well determines how you act and how you feel and what you think. Maybe because you're desperate for their approval or, or maybe just because you're just not worth, you're not into fighting with them anymore. Either way. Maybe that's it. Been there. I've been there. Or maybe it's something else. Can it be something else? Another power? A different kind of person? A different kind of presence? A Holy Spirit, perhaps? Keeping you focused amid distractions and calm in the midst of chaos? A spirit that exerts more control over your life than any other person or organization in the world, including you yourself with whatever your own issues are? A spirit that actually makes you more like you and not less? Could it be that instead? All Christians have the message of a risen Jesus. That's kind of what makes them Christian. But how many of us have truly embraced the presence of the Holy Spirit? Fewer than we care to admit. Less often than we care to admit. But we need it. Church, brothers, sisters, we need it. Because we live in a Babel world. I don't know if you remember the story. It's in Genesis 11 about the Tower of Babel. But in that story, humanity builds this tower to the heavens just to prove how amazing they are. And God sees it and decides that humanity would be, it would be better off if its blatant thirst for power and glory were thwarted. And so God causes them to speak different language so they can't work together anymore. The moral of the story is not that different languages are bad. It's that the, in the world we live in, the only thing that tends to unite us is a shared thirst for power for control of our lives and our world. And so we find like-minded people, those who speak our language, if you will, and we use our collective ability to amass power for ourselves, again, desperate for control over our lives and our world. We do it again and again. The people in the time of Babel are no different from us. We still do it. And where has it gotten us? In this 21st century? Well, I don't know if you've ever heard the word postmodern before. But whether you heard it or not, you've lived in a postmodern world for most, if not all, of your life. If you'd indulge me, quick bit of history lesson here. Pre-modern was the Western world, Europe, and the Americas before about 1700. And in the pre-modern world, it was dominated by the joint powers of church and monarchy. You did not question the king, and you did not question the pope. What they said was absolute, and you lived your life by it. The modern world came when people started to do those very things, questioning kings and popes. And when this came about, people started to look elsewhere for a guide, for truth. There's a couple places they went to. For non-Christians, science and philosophy became the primary source of truth. It actually led to amazing discoveries about the world we lived in. We learned more in this time than we had for centuries. It did see the church lose some of its influence, though. And at its worst, it's encapsulated by philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche famously declaring that God is dead. That was one side of things. For Christians, they went a different route. For them, the Bible became the primary source of truth, which is great. Of course, it actually led to a revival of personal faith as people got the Word of God in their hands and were able to read it for themselves for the first time. They finally discovered all sorts of things they hadn't realized before. And so many people either came to faith or grew in faith because of that. Unfortunately, people went too far with it. 
They went to the Bible for information, not just about God and salvation and the people of God, which is what the Bible exists to tell us about, but they went there for information about everything. Mining for answers where there weren't answers. It led just for one example, it led to the Catholic Church branding Galileo a heretic because he said that the earth revolved around the sun when the Psalms clearly say that the earth is firmly established and cannot be moved. Just as one example, finding, mining the Bible for truth that isn't meant to be there. Another name for this modern world, this period of time, is the Enlightenment. It gave us amazing technological advances on the one hand, and it gave an incredible rise of personal faith on the other hand. But it also gave us a war between science and faith, a war which neither one could win because they were never meant to be separated in the first place. God's people and God's creation were never meant to be divided. As Galileo himself is quoted as saying, I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God that endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use. He got it. Most didn't. And so as the years and centuries went by, that war raged on. Until at last, in just recent decades, people really got tired of it. The constant bickering between religious and scientific communities the constant claims to truth by people who only seem to want power and the awful sins committed by both church and state, especially in the 20th century through war after war after war, finally led people to say, enough, enough with authority, enough with flawed men claiming truth. I don't have to listen to you. I can find my own truth. My truth is my own. I need no other. Postmodern refers to this world, the world we live in now, which assumes that each person gets their own truth. It's a world where uh, Stephen Colbert has coined the word truthiness, which just means that something is true because I want it to be true, and the Oxford Dictionary made it the word of the year. Of course, it's also now the world of fake news, right? All sorts of programs which claim to tell us how it is, but really just tell us their own spin on how it is. (laughs) The postmodern world is one where it's given to each of us to decide for ourselves what is true at a time when there are more voices telling us, trying to convince us that their truth is true than at any other time. It is a babble world we live in. So many voices vying for our attention, trying to sell us on something. So what do we do? What do we do in this postmodern, post-truth world we live in? In a world full of truths that so often are found to really be lies. Lies we hate sometimes, and if we're being honest, lies we love on other times. How do we find a truth we can trust that will draw us closer to God and to each other, that will give us a foundation that we can live a life of faith on? Brothers, sisters, it's simple. It's Pentecost. It's Pentecost which means we hold fast to those two things the disciples needed to be church, the testimony of a risen Jesus and the presence of a Holy Spirit, the truth of God with us and the power of God within us. Those two alone will give us a foundation. They will change everything. In fact, let me warn you, if you embrace those two things, Your life will spin out of control. You will be freed from all those lies you used to love, which will not be comfortable at first. You'll no longer be pushed around by social media trends or the latest news story. And the people who are used to having influence over you will suddenly be very frustrated when you start resisting all their whims. 
you will be out of control. Or rather, you will be out of their control. Instead, you will be driven. You will be pushed and you will be prodded. You will be changed and transformed. You will be guided and protected and relentlessly permeated by the very Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead. The things Peter spoke of in that passage in Joel will start to happen in your life. You will speak prophetic truth to power, and it will not be popular. You will have visions of what God is doing in your life, in your communities, and you will find yourself pursuing it no matter the cost. You will call on God and God alone, and he will answer you. You will have days when you long for the way it used to be. Trust me on that. You will have days where you long for the simple life, When you allowed others to tell you what to do and what to believe, when you let the world define you, and when you believed all sorts of lies that you loved because they gave you a sense of control over things, that'll happen. But even on those days, even in those moments, you will realize the truth. That every bit of safety and security and sense of identity the world has to offer you come with chains attached. And that the only real life, the only free life, the only life worth living is a spirit-filled life. A life resting on the testimony of God with you and a life full of God within you. If you have not learned it yet, let me inform you of something. When it comes to living a life with those two things, trust and terror are no longer contradictions. Instead, they tend to fit hand in glove together. Maintaining trust in God while being terrified at what's going on, it is no longer a contradiction. In fact, it is the very definition of faith. To maintain trust while life spins out of control. And if you don't know That kind of life, I have a prayer for you today. My prayer for you today is that the message of a risen Jesus that I know almost all of you, if not all of you, have had for years on end would finally be joined by the presence of the Holy Spirit. On this day of Pentecost, on this day the church was born, my prayer for you then is that by God with you and God within you, you would be reborn into a whole new life. A life marked by God with you and within you. A life marked by trust and by terror. A life where others may influence you, but the one who exerts the greatest influence is God and God alone. My prayer for you that you would have your own Pentecost day today and tomorrow and for as many days as you have left. Would you pray with me? God, your spirit descended upon your disciples on Pentecost and on this Pentecost day, we would pray that your spirit would descend upon us as well. Let all our fears and doubts melt away. And we open ourselves, our hearts, our souls, our imaginations to your living spirit. May it fill us to bursting. May it drive us from this place into a whole new life. A life lived not just for you, but a life lived with you. A life of trust and of terror. A life of God within us proclaiming God with us. Almighty God, we offer ourselves to you as your people on your day of your church's birthday. We pray this in the name of Jesus, through the power of the Spirit. Amen. I invite you, the hymn is 529. We're going to sing all verses except for verse 3. We're going to skip that one. But would you join me in our closing hymn, How Firm a Foundation.
from this place bearing two things above all else. A message of a risen Jesus, God with us, and the presence of the Holy Spirit, God within us. Bear those with you. Live with them. And in so doing, know that you will be the greatest blessing to everyone you meet than anything else. Go with that assurance. And go as you always do go. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.